I am so excited to be going back to my roots today and talking about a bad video game. Around a year ago now, I made a video on Clock Tower 3, a game that I love because it is just so bad that it is good. The game we're going to be talking about today is made by the same team and has been called the spiritual successor to Clock Tower. So of course, I had to check it out and let me tell you, I was not disappointed. <laughs> This game is called Night Cry. We are in for a good one today, guys. Not only is this game a mess plot-wise, but everything else is a disaster too. It's got some grade A voice acting where 90% of the time the character's lips don't move. We're in a hospital in Miami. We were rescued. It's all over now. A majority of the time the dialogue isn't even voiced at all, so you're just sitting in silence while staring at this face. There are plenty of bad ends to get locked into without even knowing. Oh, you didn't find this wedding ring in chapter one? That's too bad. Looks like you're gonna die with 20 minutes of the game left. And of course, who could forget the amazing point and click controls paired with fixed camera angles that make it stupidly impossible to move. This game is a nightmare for so many reasons, but the one we're gonna be focusing on in this video is the story because I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> It's so insane and doesn't make any sense and I need you all to hear about it, so let's get into this. Let's start by giving you some background information. This game is about a group of college students and their professors. They're all aboard a cruise ship called the Oceanus because of some school trip. I couldn't really figure out what for. At the start of the game, they're all together having a fancy looking party. I'm telling you all of this now for clarity's sake because you don't learn a lot of it until later. Seriously, I didn't even know this was a group of college students until the second chapter of the game. So the game opens with one of our protagonists, Monica. She's a little drunk, so she's leaving the party for a bit. Outside, she talks to one of the ship's crew members, Eric, and he is so suspicious. He's just cutting up what looks like a blood-soaked dress, and when Monica asks him about it, he's just like, oh, a passenger told me to dispose of it. How fun. Yes, it's fun. Okay, so right off the bat, Eric is a little sketchy. Also, this isn't important, but I have to point it out because I find it so funny. Monica gives her jacket to Eric, and he just puts it in the door. As Monica is leaving, she notices that Eric has a scary looking wound on his neck and leaves. Now Monica is off to find her friend Harry and oh my god, why does she run like that? Oh. Oh no. And in case you are wondering, her running animation never changes, so that is in fact what she looks like when being chased by a monster. On her quest to find Harry, she runs into Vigo, the ship's owner, and she helps him sterilize his glass eye. Seems kind of random, but believe it or not, that's actually important. Then she finds her friends Kelly and Jessica, who tell her that Harry is on the lower floor. She gets into the elevator and there's a creepy old woman mumbling to herself in there. Then when she gets off the elevator, she sees a little girl run by. But when she meets up with Harry, he says that he didn't see any little girl. Woo, spooky. Monica tells Harry that she was chatting up a guy at the party, but he seemed more interested in someone named Rooney. Then Harry gets eaten by a vending machine. What a way to go. From Harry's blood, a monster is born. The Scissor Walker. This is how you know that this game is made by the same people who created Clock Tower. Scissor enemies are kind of a thing in those games, and when it comes to Nightcry, I guess they thought, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So now we've reached our first chase segment of the game. You have to run from the Scissor Walker, but unfortunately you have stamina to worry about. If you run out of stamina, you will just fall to the ground. Let me tell you, these characters take the stereotypical horror movie trip to the extreme because they fall a lot. And when you fall, sometimes Monica will just slide across the floor. <laughs> Also, the stamina system really sucks because there's no bar that tells you when you're about to run out and it's really inconsistent because sometimes you can run for a long time and others, you'll take two steps and you fall on your face. The main way to get rid of the scissor walker is by finding a hiding spot, but you have to pick the right one because some of them will kill you. For example, if you hide in this giant washing machine, the scissor walker will turn it on and tumble you to death and you die in like five seconds. It's kind of weird. You can also get rid of it by using objects, which is my favorite, because you'll spray it with pepper spray and it'll straight up just give up and leave. From here on out, aside from a few scripted moments, the only way that the scissor walker will show up is by examining certain objects. So if you know which objects to avoid, you can pretty much go most of the game without being chased. Monica runs into one of the crew members and he's like, hey, what's wrong? But then a server cart starts moving very slowly towards them. And at the last second, it speeds up and kills the guy. Later, Monica steals a phone off of a dead body and tweets out that there's been a mass murder aboard the Oceanus and that they need help. Monica, you better hope to God this guy has enough followers that that tweet's actually going to get seen. As you're investigating, you see the creepy ghost girl again. Ah, scary. Eventually, she ends up back in her room and gets a phone call from Jessica. She says that there's a monster killing everyone and Monica tells her that she'll be right there after she fixes this elevator. 
Inside, the creepy old lady is back, but then you just never see her again. Monica finds Jessica dead inside of a locker with a scissor walker behind her. So RIP Jessica. Later on, she finds this door, and if you enter it without your flashlight on, you die. Which sucks, because autosaves are few and far between in this game. So unless you just recently manually saved, you just got totally screwed over for opening a door. But when you go in the door with the flashlight on, there's nothing there. So what even killed you in the first place? Eventually, Monica runs into Eric. You know, the crazed dress cutter at the start. These two have an extremely normal and not totally awkward conversation. I thought I was the only survivor on this floor. <laughs> this is no time to be laughing. We have to get out of here before it comes back. Yes, yes. I just got here in search of a way to another floor. He tells her that there's an emergency rope ladder, which they can use to get to another floor, and she agrees to go with him. Then the screen fades to black, and Monica is just standing there silently making angry gestures at him for some reason. And with that, we have finished chapter one of this glorious game. Now there is a lot going on here, okay? We've got diseased crew members, a scissor walker, a creepy little girl, a ghost grandma, and sentient server carts. But how is it all connected? What does it all mean? I'm sure we're going to get lots of answers in chapter two and definitely not more questions. In this section of the game, we play as a man named Leonard. He's the student's professor and oh, oh my God, his run cycle is awful too. He talks with two of the crew members, Kobe and Eric. Wait, wait. Didn't he just go with Monica? How is he here? What? <laughs> anyway, they see a fire in the distance and Kobe says it's coming from a deserted island. They take a lifeboat and head to said island. Leonard tells the boys to stay behind and watch the boat while he goes and investigates. And let me tell you, Leonard has quite the adventure on this island. He finds all these weird people in masks. So yeah, he just discovered a cult. <laughs> and these cult members being around provide us with some truly nerve wracking stealth segments. <laughs> Then he finds this pit in the ground with all these zombie shadow people. But our man Leonard, he's not phased by it. Seriously, all he does is go, what the, and then moves on. Later, he finds an old building and inside there's a mirror. When he looks into the mirror, there's a ghost behind him. At least, I think that's a ghost. He breaks the mirror and that somehow gets rid of the ghost. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. He goes inside this house and there's a bunch of weird occult stuff in there. But you know what else is in there? A glass eye being sterilized. <laughs> No, this is not a red herring. <laughs> the game really just spoils who its villain is this early on. Leonard tweets out to his students to look for a man with a prosthetic eye, and I am obsessed with his profile picture. I also love these characters' strategy of tweeting something and hoping to God someone sees it. Leonard finds a well, and when he goes down it, discovers a passageway. He goes through this pathway that has a bunch of ghost hands waving around. Seriously, what is this? He makes it to a secret chamber and discovers the cult has a plan to perform a ritual using the Oceanus. There's also a coffin in their room and inside there's a man he seems to know named Jerome. He's passed out and has a bunch of scars all over him. Leonard takes Jerome back to the lifeboat and they all head back to the ship for some reason. I'm not sure that it's safer there, but okay. As they're rowing back, there's an explosion on the ship. This distracts Leonard and when he turns back to Eric and Kobe, one of the masked cultists is there and the screen fades to black. Chapter two has ended and I did not get any of those answers I was hoping for. Instead, there's just even more layers added onto this. There's a cult, Vigo the ship owner is somehow involved, there's this pit full of zombies, but there's only one chapter left in the game. So surely things are going to start clicking together, right? Right? So the way this chapter starts off is really confusing because there's no cutscene introducing us to who we're playing as. You're just all of a sudden this random girl. If you talk to someone, you finally figure out that your name is Rooney. If you remember way back at the start of the game, Monica was telling Harry that the guy she was flirting with seemed more interested in someone named Rooney. So that's who we're playing as. We're also taken way back in time to before everything started at the party. So major whiplash. <laughs> now, before we go any further, what does Rooney's run cycle look like? Oh no. Uh, I'm disappointed, but not surprised. I'm also obsessed with the way she investigates objects. Like, why does she lean like that? Rooney talks with everyone at the party and though, who are you? We learned that the person Monica was flirting with was this man, Jerome, AKA the guy we just saw Leonard save. Leonard introduces Rooney to Jerome. He's very rich and popular. And like Monica said, the only person he seems interested in talking to is Rooney. He also has the ability to teleport. <laughs> Rooney leaves the party and heads out onto the deck. The little girl from before appears and encourages her to jump into the water, which she almost does until Jerome shows up and stops her. He feels that he and Rooney are similar and invites her back to his room. Once he leaves, Rooney says that the feeling is gone and Connie must have given up. So we finally know the little girl's name. It seems that she's a figment of Rooney's imagination and is constantly trying to persuade her into dying. While he's waiting for her, Jerome falls asleep and has a dream about the scissor walker. 
So that's pretty sketchy. Rooney shows up and he tells her that he often has gaps in his memory. Even more sketchy. After talking to her for a bit, he leaves to go get them some food. While he's gone, an envelope addressed to him is slid under the door and Rooney hangs onto it for him. Then the scissor walker bursts out of the bathroom and right as it's about to get her, Jerome shows up and grabs it so she can run. Later, she gets a call from Kelly. Yeah, remember her? She says that she met up with some of the others and they're all hiding in this cargo hold. Rooney goes in there and- Oh no, it's Vigo! Rooney! The tweet! Leonard's tweet! This is who he was warning you about! After a bit, Rooney decides that she should leave and go look for Monica, Jessica, and Leonard because they're not there. She runs into Jerome in a stairway and he tells her that he was attacked by some masked people but managed to escape. I'm so confused on this timeline. Like, I know Jerome says that he gets gaps in his memory, but it still doesn't feel like there's been enough time since he last met with Rooney for him to get taken to a cult island and knocked out in a coffin. Rooney gives him the envelope that was slid under his door earlier, and inside is a photo of a young Jerome with his parents. He says he doesn't really remember them, and his adopted parents were sworn to secrecy and never told him about them. Rooney leaves, and she gets a call from Jessica, and she says not to trust Eric. This doesn't make any sense, though, because Jessica should already be dead by now. But whatever, I guess this is just another point towards Eric being fishy. Later, she finds an injured Monica hiding in a big storage container. She says that she went there thinking it'd be safe, but someone locked the door behind her. The last person we saw Monica with was Eric, meaning he could have been the one to lock her in there. Rooney tells her about Leonard's tweet, and Monica tells her that he's probably referring to Vigo. The next person Rooney runs into is Eric. Kobe is laying next to him on the ground, dead. It turns out that Kobe and Eric were thrown off the boat during the incident with Leonard, and Kobe drowned. Rooney tells him about how Monica is injured, and he gives her some medicine, saying that she and Monica should take it for their wounds. Now, of course, we don't trust Eric at this point. There's the dress incident at the start and his weird disease. He was with Leonard when everything went down. He was the last person to be with Monica before she was trapped. And we just got a call from Jessica saying not to trust him. So naturally, we shouldn't take the medicine that he just gave us, right? Wrong! If you don't take it, you get a bad end where you turn into a zombie. What? Why are we a zombie? Huh? Putting the zombie thing aside for now, you gave us so many reasons to think that Eric is a bad guy. But in the end, we're supposed to trust him and take the medicine? He's been a good guy this whole time? Then what is with all the weird stuff about him? It doesn't make any sense. But okay, Rudy and Monica take the medicine, and Monica says she'll catch up to her later because she needs to get her strength back. Rooney keeps exploring the ship and ends up in this infirmary looking room. There, she finds Leonard hooked up to a machine. The machine is the only thing keeping him alive because he's literally just a head and organs now. They skinned our man Leonard! I don't understand why though. Like, everyone else was just murdered, so why are they torturing poor Leonard? Rooney turns the machine off to put him out of his misery, and then Connie, the little girl, shows up and laughs at her, and is like, Oh, so killing me isn't enough? That's when Rooney decides to stand up to her because she finally remembers what happened that day. She says that they were on a boat together when her hat blew away. Rooney tried to reach for it, but Connie tried to push her because she was always mean to her. Somehow, Connie fell instead and got caught in the boat's propeller. She tells her that she's decided that she's going to live no matter what. She leaves Connie behind and we never see her again. If you're confused by what just happened, don't worry, you're not alone. <laughs> Rooney ends up being chased by the scissor walker again, so she leads it through some water and electrocutes it, and then it just kind of sadly walks away. Why does this monster just keep giving up like that? <laughs> She runs into one of the people that was hiding in the cargo hold, and she says that the scissor walker appeared in there and they all ran. So I think it's safe to assume they're all dead. Next, Rooney makes it to the captain's office. Inside, she finds Vigo's diary, which is written entirely in Slavic. There's also a translation website left open on the computer, so it seems like the captain was trying to figure out what the diary said. She reads the translation, and it says something about Vigo's daughter, Yolanda, and her son Otto, and he's an immoral child, and Yolanda should have the right to exceed humans. It doesn't make any sense because it uses a lot of flowery language, but also because it was Google translated. You know, maybe don't reveal the bad guy's motivations through a poor translation because I have no idea what I just read. Rooney moves on to Vigo's office where she finds the same family photo she gave to Jerome and a prosthetic eye with an engraving on the back. She takes the eye and heads through a secret door behind a bookshelf. It leads to a room where all the bodies of those who died are strung up like puppets. Vigo shows up and has the scissor walker go after Rooney. One of the masked cultists grabs her from behind so she can't run. The man turns out to be Jerome and he says, father is going to take us to eternal paradise. But then Monica saves the day and she whacks Jerome Rome over the head, knocking him out. They run, but the door is locked, so Monica starts beating the door with a stick, which of course doesn't do anything. The scissor walker is approaching them, and Rooney is like, I'm going to live no matter what. So she rips out her eye and puts the fake one in, and then tells the scissor walker, Revenge is yours. Destroy the man who turned you into a monster. It turns around and goes for Vigo, who gives the greatest voice acting performance I have ever heard in my life. Oh. Oh, this can't be. 
Wait. Wait. Oh, come on. No. Hey, no, 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 wait. Wait. No. No. Wait. No. He sounds like he's mildly inconvenienced. I also love that he didn't even try to run or escape. He just immediately falls on the ground and is like, no. So the scissor walker kills him and all the bodies are engulfed in a green fire for some reason. It cuts to a rescue helicopter finding the ship while Monica and Rooney wait on deck for it. So do you guys have any idea what happened in that game? <laughs> because I don't. There's so much that I don't understand. Let me just go ahead and do a speed run of all of my questions. What's the deal with Eric? Why was he so suspicious and what was with his strange disease? What happened to the old lady Monica kept seeing? What was with the cult and what exactly was the ritual for? What was Vigo's plan? Why do you randomly turn into a zombie in that one bad end? Speaking of zombies, what was with this pit full of them? Or what about the ghost? Who exactly was Connie? How did she know Rooney? If she was just a figment of Rooney's imagination, why could Monica see her? Why did they do our man Leonard like that? How was Jessica calling us from beyond the grave? Why was Jerome suddenly evil at the end? Does that have something to do with his gaps in memory? And why was he passed out in that coffin with a bunch of scars? How on earth did Rooney know that if she ripped out her eye and put in the fake one, she'd be able to control the scissor walker? And that is just scratching the surface of all of my questions. Why is none of this explained? The more I think about this game, the more questions I have. I tried looking up an explanation online, but it seems not even the internet knows what happened. Do you know how rare that is? Usually when you look up an explanation for a game online, there's at least someone who's like, oh yeah, it clearly means this. But not with this game. There's really only one thing I could find an answer for, and that's the Google Translated Diary. So apparently Vigo had a child with his daughter, Yolanda. Ew. That child was Jerome, and he was given up for adoption. Vigo somehow turned Yolanda into a monster, AKA the scissor walker. So that's why it turned on him in the end. But this still doesn't explain anything about the cult or what the purpose of this ritual was. Jerome and Vigo mentioned an eternal paradise, but what does that mean? This also doesn't explain literally everything else. I'm just as confused as I was before. So yeah, that's Nightcry. I cannot stop thinking about this game. The gameplay and voice acting are awful. It looks terrible. The story makes no sense. And despite that, I'm kind of obsessed with it in the same way that I am with Clock Tower 3. It's one of those games that is just so bad that it circles all the way back around to being amazing. <laughs> it's just so funny to me. If you guys know of any other games that are like Nightcry or Clock Tower 3, Please, I am begging you, let me know in the comments below because I need more. I want to make more videos on games like this. I want to just experience more games like this. Cheesy bad horror games has become a new favorite genre of mine, I think. <laughs> so that is going to do it for me today, guys. I need to go contemplate what the heck was up with Eric. <laughs> if you liked the video, like and subscribe. I, I can see my analytics. I can see that a majority of you aren't subscribed. What's the dealio? Aren't I cool enough for that shiny subscribe button? <laughs> That's so stupid. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye! Oh.